Could mammalian megafauna survive in the Jurassic period? This episode takes a team of 10 large mammals from the Cenozoic era and plops them in the Jurassic, when dinosaurs had taken over the world. We'll consider size, diet, competition, and threats to score each mammal out of 10. Which will thrive, and which will be eaten alive. Our first test subject is Smilodon Populator, the gigantic saber-toothed cat from Pleistocene South America. It weighed between 200 and 400 kilograms as an adult, making it more than twice as heavy as the largest modern cats. It was an ambush predator and grappler, and isotopic studies show that it dined on ground sloths, glyptodons, toxodons, camels, caimans, and horses. The Jurassic offers a different menu from what our furry friend is used to. The small Argentinian prosauropods like a Deopapasaurus would be a perfect entree, small enough to be an easy meal, while large enough to provide plenty of protein. Leonarosaurus and Brachytrichelopan were other great sources within that body plan. Isoberisaura, despite its spiky exterior, may have been a tempting meal as well. We know that Smilodon took down more heavily armored animals like Glyptodons, after all. It wasn't the only carnivore in the area, however, and would have needed to share with the small to medium theropods of South America. Pietnitskisaurus, Iwabilosaurus, and Asphaltovenator were large enough to hunt the same prey items, and the latter two were big enough to even consider Smilodon as food. The smaller theropods like Pandora Venator and Condoraptor would have posed threats to saber-toothed kittens. Not being the apex predator would be quite a paradigm shift. Smilodon was fast, agile, active, and intelligent. The long necks of the small sauropods around it would be highly vulnerable, and our theoretical breeding population of saber-tooths wouldn't have any difficulty feeding themselves. However, they weren't specialized for hunting unusually large prey like the bigger sauropodomorphs, so they'd be forced to compete with theropods their own size or bigger. The average Jurassic temperatures would also be rough, at around 5 to 10 Celsius higher than today. Smilodon Populator earns a 6 on the Thrive or Eaten Alive scale. While not the predatory all-star it was in its own time, it was an adaptable carnivore that likely would have used parental care to its advantage to stay alive in a world ruled by gigantic killer reptiles. Next up is Megatherium americanum. Hailing from Pleistocene South America as well, it was a browser that weighed up to 4 metric tons. Its bulk, combined with its claws, made it an unsavory target for hungry carnivores. It itself was not a picky eater, chomping down on grass, herbs, fruit, woody plants, and possibly even carrion. The Jurassic would limit its options somewhat, given that true fruit hadn't evolved yet, but it would likely do fine on a diet of ferns, conifers, and cycads. Native animals would give it quite a shock. Megatherium was used to being the big boy on campus, but even the small sauropods like Amygdalodon and Brachytrachelopan were already in its league. Megatherium would be able to eat the low-growing plants and keep to itself. Digging tunnels to maintain territory would be a powerful survival strategy. Megatherium was a beast and was more heavily armed than the other large herbivores it would be encountering. Small theropods like Pandora Venator and Condoraptor might attempt to go after the vulnerable young, but you'd need the largest hunters of the area, like Asphalta Venator, to even think about attacking an adult. Even then, Megatherium was quite capable in a brawl against a would-be hunter. Megatherium's claws and raw power would couple well with its unusually high agility, at least for a sloth. Modern sloths exhibit maternal care for up to a year, so it's possible that their ancient relatives did as well. That would be crucial in an environment where hungry dinosaurs are always looking for an easy meal. But even if Megatherium did exhibit advanced parental care, sloths' reproductive rate is extraordinarily slow. They give birth to one baby at a time and can only do so once every year and a half or so. Predation pressure on the young would be constant, and one slip-up would set a sloth family back years. Additionally, the Jurassic was much warmer than the Pleistocene, which hosted the most famous Ice Age. That environmental stress would have made everything more difficult. We give Megatherium a 4. While physically intimidating, its lifestyle and reproductive method are not suited to a hothouse world of giant predators that would outpace it at every turn. Paracerotherium asiaticum is one of the team's heavyweights. A huge relative of the rhinoceros, it stomped across Oligocene Eurasia and weighed between 8 and 17 metric tons. It ate soft leaves in its own time and may have struggled with the rougher ferns, cycads, ginkgos, conifers, and leptostrobales. Sustaining a body that massive on food you don't like isn't easy. The neighbors wouldn't have made things any easier. The fossil record from that part of Eurasia is poor from the Jurassic, but Vouvria from France was about as big. Abrosaurus from relatively nearby China was smaller but Hootiesaurus was considerably bigger at over 50 tons. The sauropods would focus on the higher growing plants, letting Paracerotherium snuffle about the lower forage, but the area was so huge that there was likely enough to go around anyway. The question is, what meat eaters would have dared to take on such a protein-packed rhino? 
Again, the fossil record in the area isn't great in terms of Jurassic vertebrates. There were some medium-sized predators from Europe like Eustreptospondylus, but they were far away and only would have threatened the young to begin with. Adult Paraceratherium would have been just fine at their colossal size. Paraceratherium was bigger than the competition and far too big for any local Jurassic predators to take on. It was used to living in arid environments dominated by scrub and smaller plants. However, it would require a huge territory to maintain a decently sized population. The climate in Jurassic Eurasia also swung between warm, humid climes and cold snaps, but wasn't too extreme relative to the Oligocene, which was about 8 degrees Celsius warmer than today. Paraceratherium gets a solid 7. Predators and competitors in its area were sparse, which minimizes the hazards posed by its low birth rate and slow growth. It would be able to use its size to wander from place to place, storing water and fat in large enough amounts to weather difficult seasons. Megastotherium is up next. Everyone's favorite giant hyenodont, this big-headed carnivore lived all over Pliocene Africa and weighed half a ton. It chomped on gomphotheres, aardvarks, giraffids, antelope, small hippos, bovids, and horses in its heyday, and wouldn't be terribly upset about its choices in the Jurassic period either. The small stegosaur Adratiklit from Morocco would be a tough meal, but one worth fighting for. Tezutosaurus may be on the big side, but wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility for a group of Megastotherium to take down. A single adult could probably kill an Antitonitris, and most adult Massospondylus. Adjusting to the taste of reptilian meat might be strange, but I doubt that a hyenodont would be a terribly picky eater. Of course, neither were the theropods. Afrovenator was just as big as Megastotherium and wouldn't take kindly to a strange-smelling upstart chomping into its food supply. Pteropristosaurus was big enough not only to force Megastotherium to stay away from its food, but it could have preyed on the mammal itself. And while not competitors, sauropods like Allosaurus, Spinophorosaurus, and Jobaria were also big enough that they wouldn't have seen Megastotherium as anything more than annoyance to be stomped upon. Megastotherium was large enough to take on a variety of prey items and defend itself against most of the theropods in the area, but heat would be a big issue. While the Pliocene was 2 to 3 Celsius warmer than today, the Jurassic was 10 to 15 higher. It would need to regulate its activity level while still getting enough to eat and would need to adapt to no longer being the apex. It gets a 6. On to Paracetus Colossus, the bubbly tubbly lard monster that owned the headlines in 2023 and was promptly downsized. 70 plus tons is still nothing to sneeze at though, especially for the Eocene. It lived off the coast of Peru and was likely a shallow browser, eating crustaceans and mollusks and other wee critters too foolish to flee. We don't know for sure though, since the animal's skull still hasn't been uncovered as of this video's writing. In the Jurassic, not much would have changed about its diet. Crustaceans evolved in the Cambrian, so there would have been plenty of crunchy treats for our enormous friend, and mollusks are at least as old. Heck, in the Jurassic period, most large-bodied Duraphagus vertebrates had yet to evolve, so Paracetus' only real competition would have been from shell-eating fish. As for threats, Paracetus is so much bigger than anything else in the Jurassic that there wouldn't be any predators even a third of its weight. Granted, it doesn't seem equipped with any real weaponry that we've yet discovered. If a large pliosaur decided to take a chunk out of it, Paracetus may not have been the most capable of defending itself. Paracetus was huge and essentially would have had a niche all to itself. The Jurassic was warm, but Paracetus lived in the Eocene, which is quite a bit warmer than today. We give it a 5. It would likely survive for far longer than it would in the Triassic if the pliosaurs didn't grow massive to meet the new source of delicious fatty meat. Megaloceros gigantaeus, famed as Thranduil Steed in the Hobbit movies, was busy trampling orcs before it was teleported to Jurassic. Well, it was actually trotting around Pleistocene Eurasia all the way from Ireland to Russia, but hey, Middle Earth is supposed to be an alternate history of our world anyway, so who's to say there weren't orcs to trample in the Ice Age? Anyway, Megaloceros was a half-ton grazer that chewed on herbs, shrubs, grasses, sedges, and sagebrush. Almost all of those existed in one form or another during the Jurassic, so it'd be pretty much set in terms of the menu. It would need to share with the sauropods and ornithopods of its vast territory, including Amancia, Dacentrurus, Draconix, Miragaya, and others. Its height puts it in a good spot to both eat the foliage growing at low heights as well as the taller bushes and short trees. Deer are also not above nibbling on carcasses or small vertebrates for some extra protein. Megaloceros lived with cave lions and cave hyenas, but the Jurassic brings a host of new predators to its door with a long list of difficult to pronounce names. They range in size from the diminutive Proceratosaurus, which would have still been deadly to a young Irish elk, all the way to giants like Torvosaurus, which pushed 4 tons. Megaloceros was fast, fortunately, but needed to eat a tremendous amount to maintain its fast metabolism and large size. With the abnormally high density of large predators, it would have struggled to forage safely. Herding behavior would have been crucial here. Sentry duty would be the best way to keep a group safe from animals too big and dangerous to effectively fight. 
The flesh-eating monsters of the Jurassic, combined with the oppressive heat, prevent Megalosaurus from reaching higher than a 4 on the Thrive Arena life scale. The Colombian mammoth may fare better. This titan from Pleistocene North and Central America was a browser, a grazer, a digger, and whatever else it wanted to be. A 9-ton behemoth that ate grasses, sedges, needles, oak, maple, and just about any plant it could find, making it child's play to adapt to the simple, gymnosperm-dominated ecosystem of the Jurassic. Its long trunk and tusks would be helpful in ripping up plants below the desired browsing ranges of the other animals its size, which would be sauropod dinosaurs for the most part. As a matter of fact, the Colombian mammoth may have an advantage in being smaller than many other animals in the area. Giants like Apatosaurus, Barosaurus, Brachiosaurus, and Supersaurus would have their way with the treetops and foliage of middling height, while giant ornithopods like Stegosaurus focused on the ground level plants. The mammoth's adaptability means it could eat whatever plant life was placed in front of it, switching niches on a whim. It may be a theme so far that giant Cenozoic herbivores struggle to deal with large predators, and that's no different here. But you can't blame the mammoth. It's just a fact that the Mesozoic fielded by far the most dangerous and physically powerful land predators ever. Nothing before or since has quite managed to reach the majesty of the megatheropods, and the Jurassic fielded beasts worthy of the giant herbivores it produced. Allosaurus was everywhere, and I mean everywhere. According to John Foster, as much as 75% of the carnivore biomass in the Morrison was just Allosaurus. That's a multiple ton predator that was probably the most common dinosaur in the area. It wasn't the scariest, however. Torvosaurus tanneri was a brute itself at 4 to 5 tons, although much more rare. And there was one area of North America that the Columbian mammoth would have needed to avoid at all costs, Oklahoma. Well, specifically Kenton, Oklahoma. This area in the late Jurassic was a furnace, reaching up to 50 degrees Celsius in the summer, and was home to one of the biggest theropods of all time, Sorphagonax maximus. Sorphagonax is known from about a dozen specimens and ranges in size from 5 to 8 tons. It's equipped with powerful arms with hooked claws and was a stocky, slow hunter, perfect for taking on the 20 plus ton sauropods of the area. But the Colombian mammoth, at a paltry 9 tons, would have been a snack for snacks especially considering that Sorphagonax has only ever been discovered in assemblages of multiple individuals. The mammoth's generalist diet means it would have been nutritionally successful, and it was big enough to defend itself against most predators. Social grouping and defensive rings would be effective strategies, especially when coupled with their intelligence. However, their size and strength would be less effective against predators designed to take on prey much larger than even they were. Additionally, overheating would be a serious issue in the Jurassic, and the mammoths would suffer from their slow reproductive rate. They wouldn't be able to keep up with the R-selected sauropods and ornithopods that ate their food, and giant theropods would slowly whittle away at their population. The Colombian mammoth gets a 4, a far cry from its dominance in the Triassic period. Liviuton milvilli, the enormous macro-predatory whale of the Miocene, is a different story. This monster lived fin to fin with Otodus megalodon and survived, likely giving as good as it got when the two titans clashed. At 50 to 60 tons, it's one of the world's biggest predators, and it dined on other whales, pinnipeds, and sharks. In the Jurassic, it wouldn't have such fatty dining options, but the plesiosaurs, pliosaurs, and ichthyosaurs of the world's oceans would make fine enough replacements. It's difficult to fully express how outgunned the Jurassic oceans are in this scenario. The largest macro predators of the Jurassic were the big pliosaurs, like the Kimberidge monster at about 10 meters, and Temnodontosaurus, which was the last giant ichthyosaur at approximately the same size or a little bigger. Temno was a fierce hunter for sure, but it wasn't equipped to handle a predator three times its mass with teeth the size of machetes. Liviuton was a monster, and not only would it not have any true rivals in the Jurassic, but it would make meals out of the previous apex predators. To make matters worse, the Miocene Tropical Ocean was comparable in temperature to the Middle Jurassic, so the home terrain advantage would be essentially nullified. The only disadvantage that Liviuton possesses here is the slow reproduction rate of giant cetaceans but given how dominant it would be over everything in its environment, that wouldn't really be a problem. Liviuton takes home a perfect 10 from the Jurassic Oceans. Our ninth contender is a new one to the series. Stegotetrabelodon was a four-tusked elephant that lived in the Miocene and Pliocene and has been found in Kenya, Uganda, Arabia, and even Italy. Its two pairs of tusks indicate an interesting lifestyle. It was huge at 11 to 12 tons and would have needed to both dig and browse in order to sustain its body mass. Given that it lived in a wet area, it may have sifted through water plants to find enough food. It may have needed to do the same in the Jurassic, as well as survive on cycads and ferns. The large herbivores of the area aren't as well known, but it's possible that Stegotetrabelodon may have faced competition from migrating herds of sauropods from the south. 
the Craeosaurus, Spinosaurus, Jobaria, and Atlasaurus were roughly in its size range or bigger, and would cut down on its precious food supply. True giants like Giraffatitan would have focused on higher growing plants outside of Stego's range. But in terms of predators, Stego wouldn't have much to worry about. Afrovenator may have attacked its young, but the famous elephant group defense would be mostly effective against such a small predator. Pteropristosaurus, if it ventured north from Tanzania, would be more of a threat, but not existential. The issues for this wacky elephant would be chiefly environmental, given the higher Jurassic temperatures and low food supply. Overall, it earns a 5. Our last team member on this list of 10 invasives is Deodon Shoshonensis, the winner of the Triassic Round. A half-ton native of Miocene North America, Deodon is the perfect omnivore. It devoured nuts, roots, vines, meat, and even bones. In the Jurassic, it would have rampaged as before, gobbling up plant matter and meat alike and forcing the native fauna to respond or be rooted out. Medium herbivores and carnivores like Camptosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Dilophosaurus, Gargoyleosaurus, and Martiosaurus all would have been put under pressure. But huge carnivores like Torvosaurus and Allosaurus would welcome the sudden influx of fresh meat. And they'd actually be big and strong enough to take on the Satan pig and add it to their own menu. Sorophagonax, fortunately, is less likely to take notice. It's too busy decimating the Colombian mammoth population to deal with a biker gang of demonic bacon. Deodon was a fast runner with good eyesight and a flexible diet. It had strong jaws and could defend itself in a pinch, and although it wasn't a true pig, may have been just as fierce of a fighter. It did need a high energy intake to sustain its brutal lifestyle, and it may have struggled to adapt to an ecosystem in which it was no longer the scariest bully at the watering hole. It wasn't strong enough to take on the giant predators of the Jurassic, but it was certainly mean enough to wedge itself into a multitude of niches and gain a solid hoofhold on this ancient battlefield. It's worthy of a 7, finishing off our list. Thank you for traveling to the Jurassic period with me. Comment below with your thoughts on how these animals would fare, as well as what you'd like to see in future installments. Don't forget to check out the first episode and join the channel so I can keep bringing you paleontology and speculative ecology videos like this one. If you join the Megasaur Pod tier, you get to request a species profile video when you sign up, and again for each year you're part of the tier. All channel members gain unique emojis and can level up their loyalty badges as time passes. Don't forget to subscribe to stay updated on the series. I'm the Vividen, and I'll see you next time.